Welcome to this video in which I will teach you about Gibbs free energy. So, at last, I can finally, yay, teach you about something called Gibbs free energy. Note, it's not really free. So you might remember that we learned back in chapter 5, linked to floating above my head or in the description below, that generally speaking, exothermic reactions, that is reactions where delta H or change in enthalpy is negative, are usually thermodynamically fail are usually thermodynamically favorable, though if they have high activation energies, as depicted in this figure, they might not occur very quickly. Now, by comparison, endothermic reactions are generally thermodynamically disfavored. Now, a quick way to identify a reaction as being exothermic or endothermic is if you are given the energy coordinate diagram. If the reactants are at a lower level than the products, then your reaction is endothermic. If the reactants are at a higher level than the products, then your reaction is exothermic. In contrast, if they're at the exact same level, then it's isothermic. Now, sadly, ooh, enthalpy change, or delta H, does not really tell us the full story. For example, if you melt ice at room temperature, it totally happens spontaneously, yet it is an endothermic reaction. We know that melting ice is endothermic because it feels cold when you touch it. Thus, it is endothermic, but it still occurs spontaneously at room temperature, which indicates that it is thermodynamically favorable. So why in the world does this happen? I mean, obviously, the delta H or change in enthalpy does not tell us the full story. In the case of melting ice, delta H is disfavorable because it's endothermic, and yet it still happens spontaneously. So why does it happen spontaneously? The answer is because of entropy. You see, as we melt ice, entropy or disorder increases significantly because we're going from a solid that's like this to liquid like this. So you have positive delta S change in entropy. And it turns out that the delta S at room temperature is positive enough, favorable enough to offset the positive disfavorable delta H. In other words, delta S in the case of melting ice at room temperature is favorable enough to compensate for the unfavorable delta H. And by way of review, positive delta H is unfavorable, negative delta H is favorable, and those signs are the opposite for delta S. So positive delta S is favorable and negative delta S is unfavorable. Now that of course begs the question, is there some kind of mathematical term that includes both enthalpy and entropy? The answer is yes. It's called Gibbs free energy, also known as delta G. And mathematically, delta G can be expressed by using this equation, where T is temperature in kelvins. Now, as you can see in this equation, delta G incorporates both enthalpy and entropy. Thus, if you know delta G, then you also can automatically know if the process is spontaneous or not, regardless of what delta H or delta S are, because delta G incorporates both both of them. Delta G is the awesomest. As a warning though, when doing delta G calculations, be sure to watch your units. So if we keep in mind that delta G does include both entropy and enthalpy, then we can understand the following facts outlaid by our textbook. First, if delta G is negative, then the reaction is spontaneous. Conversely, if delta G is positive, then the reaction is non-spontaneous. And lastly, if delta G is zero, then your reaction is at equilibrium. Now, as it turns out, a reaction whose delta G is negative, a spontaneous reaction, is called exergonic, while a reaction whose delta G value is positive, that is a non-spontaneous process or reaction, is called endergonic. That takes us then to a beautiful example problem, which says an endothermic reaction with a positive delta S or entropy value can still be which of the following? I invite you to attempt this on your own, and then you can click the link that's floating over my head or in the description beneath this video to see the answer. And next, from the answers that you got on question number 19, which we posted in an earlier video a while back, and I'll have the link floating over my head or posted in the description beneath this video, please calculate the delta G for the reaction shown here. We finish then with some more information about delta G. So just like delta S and delta H, which we discussed in an earlier video that I posted a link to somewhere in the description below or floating over my head, delta G can be calculated by using this equation. Looks very similar to the delta S and delta H equations, where the term right here for product represents the sum of all of the individual G values for the product, each multiplied by its individual coefficient. And this term for reactants is the same, just for reactants. Make sense? Good. That takes us to our final topic, 
how in the world do you calculate k or the equilibrium constant from delta g? Now, as it turns out, delta g can also be used to calculate a reaction's equilibrium constant k by using the equation shown here, which I will not make my university students memorize, and where t must be in kelvins and r, the ideal gas constant in terms of energy, is this value right here. That brings us with some finalizing awesome questions. First, given the thermodynamic data shown in the table right here, please calculate the equilibrium constant or K for the following reaction. As per usual, I'll have a link to an answer video somewhere below or floating over my head. And last, using data from appendix C in our text, what is the equilibrium constant K at 298 for the reaction shown here? Again, I'll post a link somewhere over my head or in the description below to a video in which I show you how to do this problem. That ends our discussion here on thermodynamics, delta G, the third law of thermodynamics, and all of the rest. Thank you, my wonderful students and other viewers, for paying attention thus far. I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Please have an enjoyable rest of your day.